God is calling for some church people today who know who they are and are confident in who they are, so confident that they are not encumbered with the stress of trying to fit in. Mm, yes, yes, yes. If you, if you are trying to be the kind of believer that doesn't make waves, you should get up and leave the service right now because I don't have a sermon for you. I have a message for people who are willing to disrupt some things to be in the will of God. I came to talk to people who are tired of church as usual and they're ready for church unusual. They're ready to go to the next level and they're willing to be radical and be labeled radical and even heretics because you know what God has spoken in your life and you're willing to stand on the word of God rather than the friends and the people around you. Now understand that there was great controversy existing at this point in the text. In Jerusalem, there was a great a discord that was much terrible. Jesus had shaken everything up. Everything up. Stepped on the scene, shaking things up. The religious people despised him. He was very controversial. It's difficult for us to understand that because we worship him and we totally accept him and embrace him but in the time that Jesus ministered in he was extremely controversial he was greatly disliked by the majority of religious people and he came in and started ministering and spent a little over three years ministering and poofed out of there and left everything shaken said to the disciples all right boys I'm turning it over to you Whoever told you that if you accept Jesus Christ, everything's going to be calm, lied. Jesus will shake up anything he gets in. He will shake up everything. If you want everything to be calm and quiet, don't fool with the Lord. Because if the Lord comes around, he will shake up everything. Mess up all your plans. He'll fool with your finances. You were going to put it over here. He'll say, no, put it over there. You were going to go to this university. He'll say, no, I want you to go over there. He'll turn your life around. He'll get all in your business, tell you who to marry, who not to marry. He gets in your sex life. He gets in your personal life. Oh, y'all don't mind if I get real. Jesus will get in everything. If you're too loud, he'll tell you to calm down. If you're too calm, he'll tell you to get up and Praise me. He has a way of breaking rules in your life. He's radical. Once he stirred everything up, he turned it over to the disciples, and these disciples had to be wise. Oh, God, give us wise men. We've got great men and big men and big name men, but we need wise men. We need men who are balanced. My idea of a wise, mature believer is somebody who is balanced, not going to either extreme. The church has a tendency to swing like a pendulum from one extreme to the other, but you need to come to the point that you're balanced. Peter and John were committed Christians, but they were not interested in discord they still had not given up uh, on their Judaistic brothers and were willing to come into hostile environments for the benefit of winning some they were willing to come into hostile rooms where there were eyes being rolled at them people sneered and everybody was not accepting of them because they knew that he that winneth souls is wise a balanced people that's what we need today is people who are balanced not so liberal that they've lost all standards and not so legalistic that they've taken us back to the law but people who are standing in a balanced interpretation of who Christ is when you see Peter and John coming up at the hour of prayer, that is what you see them coming. They're coming into a volatile atmosphere. Many people were worshipers. Many people were leery of them. Many people believed in the power of Jesus Christ. Many of them thought he was a heretic. It was into that climate that they're coming. And on their way up, first of all, I want to thank God that they were still coming. Because the people today, if you don't agree with them about everything, they can't worship with you. I mean, if you don't tie your shoes the way they say tie your shoes, they fall out and split the church. 
I'm not talking about anything going on in Oklahoma, but back in Texas, people will fall out over hairdo, over makeup, over earrings, over tissue paper, shoelaces, baptism, communion cups, anything. We've fallen out over so many things, we've forgotten what we fell out about. We're not speaking to people who can't even remember what we're mad about. But when God has sent you on a mission, you cannot afford to have your mission compromised by people's attitudes and concepts. You have to speak the truth and keep on walking. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Peter and John came up at the hour of prayer and the Bible says that as they walked along they encountered this lame man who was at the gate called Beautiful. Now this man is an interest, interesting man because he is stuck outside of the religious mania, the system, the turmoil and the atmosphere. He's stuck outside of that and he has not become a part of that and you need to understand that many times while we are headed to the place of worship, the greatest ministry happens outside. And one of the, if you don't understand that, you will never be who you need to be in the Lord because you'll come in the church and sit around and become frustrated waiting on your opportunity to be heard, to speak, to sing your song, to get your praise in. You don't understand that you didn't come in here to be seen. And you didn't come in here to be heard. And this church wasn't built for you to have a platform to exploit your gifts and talents. This is a training camp. This is a boot camp camp this is a military operation when you see us come together like this this is a convocation you're in a boardroom right now you're in a spiritual boardroom so that you can get the memos so that you can execute your job which is outside of these doors I tell people when they come to Potter's house you didn't come here and join this church to preach you came here to be taught. Jesus said, when, whenever he got ready to teach, he said, come. Whenever he got ready to use him to preach, he said, go. You don't see Jesus saying, come preach. He said, go preach. He said, come unto me, all ye that are weak and heavy laden, I will give you rest. He talked to them about coming that they might teach and take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is easy, my burdens are light. But when you come in here, you came in here to get fed. You, when you walk out of this door, you ought to activate, sister. You ought to come alive, brother. You ought to get on fire because the real fight is not going to be in here. It's going to be out there. And people who don't understand that get in fights in here because they're bored, fat, lazy Christians who don't do anything any else and you've got to use the power to fight amongst yourselves rather than get out. Right outside the gate, there's somebody who needs you. Right outside your religious dogma, there's somebody who could be blessed by your testimony. I don't want to hear your testimony. I don't need to hear it in church. I need to hear it in Kmart and Big Bear and Kroger's and the grocery store. Get outside of here and go to work. If you don't understand that, you start majoring on the minor and minoring on the major. And you start doing spiritual warfare in the church and you're in there pleading the blood and I'm going to straighten out this church and I'm going to straighten them out till they all agree and bring them in. Let me tell you, we're not going to all agree. I don't care what you do. You can't even get your own kids to agree. You and that crazy woman you married don't agree. You and that ugly man you got don't agree, but you stay married. You can't get the whole church to agree on the color of carpet on the floor. And if Jesus is going to wait for us to all agree before he comes, he can't even come back. But while people are arguing about foolishness, there's a ministry going on right outside the door. And God is looking for somebody who's ready to go into the enemy's camp and take back what he stole. Oh my God. And they were coming up to the temple at the hour of prayer, just going up to pray. And they said, wait a minute, man. Here's the ministry out here. Here's the ministry out here. Our purpose, and I'm going to talk to you about three things. Our purpose, 
our problem and our power. Our purpose, the reason that we're here, we often stumble into our purpose. You, you don't always understand your purpose, you just bump into it. While you're just doing your normal religious thing, you stumble into your purpose. You don't even understand exactly what you're called to do or how God's going to use you or the details, but God has a way of letting you stumble into your purpose. And your purpose is generally revealed in somebody else's problem. Your purpose is generally revealed in somebody else's problem. And if you're looking for your purpose tonight, I need to ask you, can God trust you with somebody's problem? Because until God can trust you with somebody's problem, you'll never find your purpose. The very thing you may have been turning your nose up at may be the very thing that gives you purpose in your life. God call you to get involved with the stinky stuff. Stuff, to deal with people's problems and situations and turmoil and you will find even though you have problems yourself as you reach out to help other people you will find so much purpose in serving other people that you quit worrying about your problems trying to minister to their problems and it's amazing that what you give out comes back to you pressed down shaken together and running over if you want some help, you got to give up some help. If you want some love, you got to give up some love. If you want some ministry, you got to give up some ministry. If you want some money, you got to give up some money. Give and it shall be given unto you again. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and run it over. So right at the moment that these guys were coming up to pray, and people generally go up to pray because they need to ask God for something. God said, I don't want you to come up with your grocery list of what all you need me to do. Before you start telling me what you need me to do about your situation, I'm going to let you stumble upon somebody else's problem. Because this is not about you. Oh, I feel like I'm prophesying to somebody. What you're going through is not about you. God is just strategic, strategically putting you in a place so that you can help somebody else. Everything you've ever gone through has prepared you to be able to help somebody else. And if you ever get your mind off of your selfish, self-enthroned, egotistical self and start saying, use me, Lord, in thy service, God will let you stumble up on somebody who's worse off than you and your anointing will activate you're not going to get your anointing with people laying hands on you, spitting in your face, and putting oil on your head. Your anointing's going to come upon you as you get involved in somebody else's problems and dare to try to help them. That's when the power of God is going to rock your world. The reason we have to preach so hard and shout so hard and work so hard is that we're preaching to couch potato Christians who come to church for entertainment. But if you ever get busy doing something for the Lord, God will do some amazing things in your life. Talk about your purpose is often revealed in somebody else's problem. And somebody else's problem often releases the power of God in your life. As you begin to reach out to them, the power of God ignites in your life. They stumbled up on this guy. It's the hour of prayer. It's an hour that they normally would come in and say, Lord, we need, we need, we need. But they stumbled up on somebody who was in more trouble than them. When things get really bad for you, I mean really bad, I mean really bad, try to find somebody worse off because it'll help you. I mean, you may have to get in the car and go down to the AIDS ward or the cancer unit or you may have to go down to the homeless shelter to get encouraged. I know you want to get some real anointed person to come up and spit on you to make you feel better, but you need to go and get some real lame person. And in the process of helping them, it'll heal you. They stumbled up at the hour of prayer. 
and they come upon this guy. And this man had three issues, three issues. First of all, he was broken. He was broken and he was broken from his mother's womb. So brokenness was all he'd ever known. It's one thing to be somebody who walked and then suddenly became crippled and couldn't walk. He had never experienced freedom and mobility of movement. He had always been incapacitated. He had always been the guy left behind and the one overlooked. He was dysfunctional. He did not operate correctly. And yet God had allowed him to be placed in close proximity to the power of God. I want to say tonight, is anybody listening to me? I want to say to the person that's come in this room and you're broken and things have never gone right. You look all the way back down through your life and you say, things never went well for me. I've never seen things that other people have seen. I've never had the joy or the love or the relationship or the health or the friends or the support that I see other people have. I've never felt normal. I've always had a situation to deal with a crisis, a dilemma, a turmoil, and adversity. I want you to know just because it's always been that way doesn't mean it's got to stay that way. He had been lame from his mother's womb. He was broken. That was all he'd ever known. And yet, whether you realize it or not, it is not just that Peter and John were going to be used to help this man. This man was also being used to help Peter and John. That's why you got to be careful about who you run off. Because sometimes people and their problems are being used to be a blessing to you. you. You never felt significant until you got around somebody who really needed you. The problem with you now, you hang around people who don't need you. They disregard you and they don't respect you. I learned to help people who are really hurting because people who are really hurting don't care about a whole lot of foolishness. They don't want to argue about anything. They don't care who's got the most members. They don't care whether you sing good or not they don't care if you get out of tune they don't care whether you got a CD or not they just want some help they want some healing they want some deliverance and God had caused these two groups of people to collide would you just take a moment and touch three people and tell them there's a reason you're sitting beside me there's a reason you're sitting beside me it's no mistake. It didn't happen by accident. God didn't mess up when he set you by me. There's something in me that's going to bless you. And there's something in you that's going to bless me. And before this night is over, we're going to both walk into our purpose in a way that we never had it before. Somebody praise God up in here. Yes. No, no, no. I said praise God. I didn't say clap. I said praise God. The man was broken. He was broken. He was shattered. He was incapacitated. He was limited. He could do some things, but he couldn't do everything. Whether you want to talk about it or not, everybody in here is limited somewhere. <laughs> nothing wrong with his hands nothing wrong with his eyes he wasn't blind like Bartimaeus he didn't have a withered arm like the man with the withered hand it was nothing like that there was nothing wrong with his ability to smell there was nothing wrong with his ability to hear he wasn't deaf he wasn't hard of hearing but you had to look a while but somewhere in his life he was incapacitated I don't care how good you look what you own, what you drive, who you're married to, how many kids you have in some place in your life you're limited everybody needs everybody else, you can sit up and look important and act like you don't need anything and you may fool everybody in here but you ain't fool me cause I know somewhere if it's not your knees it's your ankles, if it's not your ankles it's your toes, if it's not your toes it's your hands if it's not your hands it's your job if it's not your job it's your kids if it's not your kids it's your marriage if it's not your marriage it's your house if it's not your house it's your company but somewhere in your life you're limited oh 
My God, I thank you that limited people can come to the house of God too. Oh, I thank you because God's grace is an equal opportunity expert. Anybody can be a recipient of God's grace. I said anybody. I said anybody. And here he is with his lame self outside of this religious dogma and structure and philosophizing and debating and disagreement. He's just out there trying to get a little help. He told you there's three things about him. He was broken. Number two, he was begging. Because broken people do beg. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> If you've never done any begging, it's because you've not recognized your brokenness. <laughs> because if you ever recognize your brokenness, you're going to beg somewhere. You might not beg where we see you. You may slip it in a note. You may put it in an email. You may do it at 1 o'clock in the morning. You might do it over lunch. But if you're broken somewhere, sooner or later, you're going to do some begging. You're going to do some, well, I wish I had a friend. I wish I had somebody I could talk to. I wish I had somebody I could trust. I wish I had somebody who would pray for me. Broken people do beg. And so there he was, just a begging. And I talked to you, I believe several years ago, I talked about the cup process and how he just had the cup. You remember how I preached about the cup and how he just asking, oh, this man begging. But see, the thing you have to understand about him begging, he uh, didn't exactly know what he needed. Have you, have, you, have, you ever, have you ever uh have you ever needed something but you didn't you just didn't you, you, you just didn't quite exactly know and, and this is this is the problem i have sometimes you know a preacher was at my church recently and he's preaching about he said that tonight is your night and he said i want you to just ask god for whatever you need him to do about your situation he said just ask him and god's gonna do it and i got happy but when i got ready to ask him i couldn't figure out what to say have you ever had a problem that you didn't know how to advise god you weren't exactly sure what needed to be done about it. You, didn't you knew you needed something, but you weren't exactly sure what. And I was scared to ask God for something because I might ask him for something and it might not be the right thing. And he might do it because I said it. Oh, y'all don't know. Let me talk to y'all over here. Have you ever been in a dilemma where you knew you needed something, but you wasn't exactly sure what it was? It's just like a woman who goes in the store shopping and the, and the lady comes up and says, may I help you? And you say, I'm just looking. What you're really saying is, I know I need something, but I'm not sure what color, what size. I don't know whether it's a suit, a dress, a handkerchief, but I do know that when I see it, I know what it is. The Bible said that the beggar was just looking at him, expecting to receive something. I, oh God, I came to church tonight. I didn't know what they were going to preach, but I'm expecting to receive something. I didn't come out through the traffic, put on my clothes, and rush in here just to say I was here. If I'm going to come to church, y'all excuse me because I'm feeling like preaching. If I'm going to come to church, I'm expecting to receive something. Touch your neighbor, tell him I'm getting ready to receive. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, don't you kid yourself. I'm getting ready to receive. I'm not just hollering and jumping. I'm getting ready to receive something from the Lord. And the reason I had you tell your neighbor, because all your neighbors can't handle it when you start. Oh, I wish I had some real people. 
You know, you can't even live by everybody when you start receiving something. You can't even tell everybody when you start receiving something. Some people don't like you when you start receiving something. As long as you're down and out, you was okay. But the moment you start receiving something, now they got an attitude. So you got to warn people, I'm getting ready to receive. So if you got an attitude, you better move right now. Hallelujah! 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 Hey! Look at him telling the Lord's getting ready to bless me. Yeah, he's getting ready to bless me. So if you counting on me and being broke down and depressed and discouraged, I'm getting ready to shock you. The Lord's getting ready to turn my situation all the way around. The Lord's getting ready to pull me all the way up out of this. God's getting ready to bring me out. I know I started out broke, but my money's coming. I know I started out single, but my honey's coming. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Everything. God promised me is about to break loose in my life. Somebody say it. My God, my God, my God, my God. Is there anybody in here that's been feeling like something's about to happen? You said, well, the devil said, you might as well just die. And you said, well, maybe I will, but not right now. I think I'll wait. Because I feel like something's about to happen. I don't exactly know what's going to happen. I don't know who God's going to use. I don't know how God's going to answer me. I don't know which way the money's coming from. But I got a feeling that before this is over, God is getting... Y'all keep jumping up, sit down, relax, relax. And, uh, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Oh Lord. Anyway, let me get a grip on myself. I'm getting myself happy. And, uh, I better not get happy tonight. I don't, I don't know what'll happen if I get happy tonight. I feel like demons are starting to tremble right now. I feel like somebody's about to get a breakthrough right now. I feel like somebody's about to get snatched out of your trouble tonight. Your head. Now, you may not get what you want, brother, but God's getting ready to give you what you need. There's a difference between getting what you want. See, he just wanted a little, little change. Give me a little change. But see, there, there are some prayers that don't solve the problem. A little change really wasn't going to fix it. Because giving him a little change was only going to be a band-aid on a problem that continued to reoccur in his life. Whoever I'm preaching to tonight, when God fixes this, it ain't going to be a patch job. It ain't going to be a temporary solution in an ongoing problem. Oh, when God, I know you went through a lot of pain, but God let you go through the pain because he's getting ready to fix it. And when he fixes it, it's going to be fixed for good. You ain't going to have to keep coming back and hopping around and pulling a law. No, God said when I fix this, it's going to stay fixed. You're going to be walking and leaping and praising God. And, 
perhaps, perhaps the man's problem was that he had had a series of people who had provided temporary solutions to long-term problems, enablers who create codependent relationships. <laughs> who just help you get by th the day, but don't really fix you where you're completely free. So, so Peter, Peter, was, Peter and John were not afraid to say something to him. First of all, they said, look on us. You have a right to expect something from me. If I come in here tonight to minister, you have a right to expect something from me. There's no longer no right, there's no reason in the world for me to be frustrated because you expect me to minister on a certain level. Because if I, was, if I didn't come with anything, I should have stayed where I was. You have a right to expect something from Peter and John said, look on us. Good God, I fear you. Look on us. We need a church today that'll come out of the closet and stop hiding and tell the world, look on us. Yes, we got the answer. Yes, we got the power. Yes, God is blessing us. Yes, we're building churches. Of course, we're building churches. The kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. What did you think we were going to do? Did you think we were going to stay in the storefront? Did you think we were going to stay in them little wood frame churches? How can we preach about the greatness of God and not experience the greatness of God in our own life? The devil is alive. I said the devil in a liar. If the New Agers can have money and the astrologers can have money and the Harry Christmas can have money, I got some. You don't see nobody ever say anything about them. Nobody ever intimidates them. Nobody ever says they shouldn't be successful. You don't see anybody talking about Farrakhan's house. But when you say Jesus, people want you to stay in your place. But touch somebody and say, look on us. I oh, see y'all are not ready for that. I just came to talk to radical people who come to church looking good, smelling good, dressing good, driving good, go to work, say, yeah, I'm smelling good, got my hair done, I'm supposed to. I'm a child of the king. I'm a seed of Abraham. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. Yeah, look. Said, uh, they said, uh, look on us. They weren't afraid to deal with his expectation. Second thing is, they weren't afraid to disappoint him. They said, silver and gold, have we none? I'm not going to do what you want me to do. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, give us some more preachers, teachers, and leaders who can look the crowd in the face and say, I'm not doing what you expect me to do. I refuse to be an entertainer. I'm going to do what God told me to do. Uh-huh. I'm going to do what God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to do what God told me to do. Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have. Oh, my God. I feel like preaching now, y'all. <laughs> I want somebody to just touch somebody and say, I got something to give. Mm -hmm. I got something to give. You're not going to tell me I went through everything that I went through and I didn't come out with something to give. The devil is a liar. You're not going to tell me I cried all night long and I don't have something to give. I got something. It may not be what he got. It may not be what she got. But I got silver and have I none but such 
as I have, give I unto thee. And then he says, in the name of God. In the name. You know, when I said that just then, and I hollered in the name, I could feel demons tremble because the devil don't like for you to call the name of Jesus. You can call anybody else's name you want to. You can call Jake's name. You can call the president's name. You can call the governor's name. But when you say Jesus, demons tremble at the sound of his name. The name of Jesus has been exalted above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess somebody who loves and say Jesus I'm talking about the water walker somebody say Jesus I'm talking about my mountain mover somebody say Jesus I'm talking about my lily in the valley somebody say Jesus I'm talking about my bread of heaven somebody say Jesus my wheel in the middle of a wheel. Jesus, my bridge over troubled waters. Jesus, my meal offering. Jesus. And he said, he said, in the name of Jesus, Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Shake your neighbor and tell him your situation is about to move. Your situation is about to move. Somebody in that balcony jump up and give God a crazy praise. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, 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 I'm talking to you, hallelujah, pray them, that stiff thing, that limited thing, that broken thing, that weak thing, God said I'm getting ready to move it, try it, yeah. Well, they told him, they said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. But the problem was, he didn't move. What do you do when you've done all you know how to do? And you prayed all you know how to pray. And you said everything you know how to say. And the problem still won't move. What do you do after you've paid your tithes and offerings, served the Lord, and treated your neighbor right? And the problem still won't move. What do you do when you know you've been a good husband, but you still got a problem in your house? And you know you've been a good wife, but the problem is still standing there anyway. He could have walked away and said, this isn't working. And this is what separates the saints from the ain'ts. Because some people, after they've said their little magic words and nothing happens, they quit. You'll never get the power to pull people out if you quit and I came to tell somebody tonight that the devil is not after your ankles and the devil's not after your money and the devil's not after your marriage it's just that the devil is trying to make you quit touch somebody and say don't quit now, now this I'm getting ready to go somewhere everybody can go because by now, all the religious people have quit. So I don't have nobody left to talk to but the radical people. The radical people. The people that don't have anything to lose. 
nothing to go back to. Backslide to what? Give up! 